Mega Man X5 is one of the most interesting games in the Mega Man X series because every time you talk about it with someone else who played it, they're bound to have a different opinion on it than the last person. Mega Man X5 is probably the most divisive game in the X series and I can totally see why. Some appreciate it for its climactic nature and replay value, but many think the game is bogged down by a myriad of bad design choices. Now where do I stand on this? Well, the title of the video says as much. I think Mega Man X5 is fundamentally a flawed game. Today, we shall explore why this is, but before we get into that, in case you don't know, a few months back I celebrated the 5th anniversary of my video series, the all-inclusive Mega Man X Retrospective, by re-reviewing Mega Man X1, X2, X3, and X4. These are some of my best videos in recent memory, if you ask me. I'm now met with an interesting challenge. I got in the mood to play Mega Man games again in the last couple weeks, so now we're back to covering Mega Man games. This time we're finishing the Mega Man X series re-reviews by covering the rest of the series just in time for the 5th anniversaries of the original videos on these games from 2017. Seriously, I reviewed Mega Man X7 on March 28th of 2017. There are people who got into my videos from that time who still watch me to this day. Time flies, right? Anyway, talking about Mega Man X5 and onward again is an interesting challenge simply because of the fact that my attitude surrounding these games is completely different from X1 to X4. Those are four of my favorite games ever made, when I almost never come back to the later four games because, well, I'm just not that into any of them. But each for a different reason which we'll be diving into over the course of the next four videos. To start, we have the subject of today's video, Mega Man X5. X5 is, like I said before, fundamentally flawed. But I didn't always think that. Of any X game, I'd say this is the one where my opinion has changed the most since the original playthrough. In that, I mean it has been a smooth line trending downward since I first got to playing X5 in early 2015. I first hailed it as the second best behind X1, and from that, it's gradually fallen. When I first reviewed it, I said it was a good time, but the start of a massive quality decline in the X series. I guess you could say that's still my opinion, I just think that the flaws outweigh the fun factor. But I want to start this discussion with the things that X5 definitely gets right because they do exist. In Mega Man X4, you had to choose between playing as X or as Zero, both of their unique pros and cons, as Zero could attack enemies up close with his Z Saber, while X would blast from afar using his X Buster, but in X5, you start with a character select screen like you did in X4, which would lead the first time player to believe that you had to choose which one you'd be playing as during the campaign like you did in X4. However, the character you choose is the one that gets a benefit during the campaign, but the journey is shared between X and Zero. If you pick X at the start, you get a weaker version of the 4th armor from X4. It can't do the Nova Strike, it doesn't have infinite ammo, but it does still have the Hover and the Plasma Shot right at the start, which is pretty awesome. Picking Zero at the start gives you this incredibly slow Z-Buster attack, which almost never comes in handy from my experience, so the choice is clear. Pick X from the start. No matter which you pick, at the start of each stage, you just select which of the two characters you play as, as well as picking what armor X will bring with him. You could argue this cuts down on replayability compared to the two campaigns of X4, or maybe that it leads to a bunch of balance issues throughout the game, which it certainly does, but I like the idea of X and Zero being a team that handles these big crises together. Not quite at the level of the partner mechanic from X7, but a step in that direction as I like to trade off which of the two hunters I'm playing as from level to level. In a mechanical sense, X5 adds crouching to the Mega Man moveset. You'd think that a feature like that would have been added to a run-and-gun platformer much sooner than... 14 platformers in, but still, I think it's a good mechanic that the game puts to really good use in several segments, like dodging the beams from the U555 or reaching enemies that are really low to the ground. I wouldn't call it a dash or Z Saber game changer since it only comes back in X6 and X7 and none of the other later Mega Man platformers, but a mechanic doesn't have to be genre defining in order to be good. X5 also adds this rope grabbing system, which is also put to good use, although his tutorial is not the best. I mean, you could just jump over this gap like I did in my first playthrough, so I got killed by this rope part in Grizzly Slash's stage a few times in that first run because of that. As far as the gameplay is concerned, that's honestly the last note I have in this game that's unambiguously positive, like no caveat at the end of the sentence. But before we get into the meat of X5's problems, I saw no better time than the present to mention that the soundtrack of this game is absolutely spectacular. In my X4 re-review, I had said the game had what was probably my least favorite X soundtrack on the PS1, and to my surprise, the comments did not agree with that take whatsoever. Going into this video, I posted a poll on my community tab asking everyone what the best Mega Man X soundtrack on the PS1 was, and to my surprise once more, X4 led the poll like it was nobody's business. X4's music being better than the PS1 rendition of X3 is something I can certainly agree with, but I really think X5 and X6 are home to some of the best music in the series past X1. X5 has some of the most iconic tracks in the series, like X and Zero's opening stages, the Zero stage themes, and the X vs. Zero boss fight. And besides that, it's full of absolute bops, including, but not limited to.
With all that out of the way, we can get into the issues I have with this game. What made Mega Man X1 through X4 some of my favorite games of all time was the unique blend of fast-paced reactive platforming combined with the contained exploration and open-ended progression. The X games having cool set pieces like rising and lowering platforms in Storm Eagle stage from X1, falling blocks in Crystal Snail's level from X2, rushing water pushing you down a shaft you needed to climb up in X3, or falling magma rocks you had to time your jumps for in X4, allowed the games, at their best, to feel really fast-paced and frantic while giving you things to explore for in the levels. The collectibles in these early Mega Man X games allowed players to take advantage of the open-ended boss progression that Mega Man has always had, only now you can structure a run based around item collection. These three things are how I look at Mega Man X games, and X5 falters at many of them. Starting with the level design, X5 isn't lacking in set pieces like the train car escape sequence in Grizzly Slash's level or deactivating bombs in the Skyverse stage. The game has set pieces you can recall that make each one distinct, but the problem comes from how many of them serve to slow the pace of the game down rather than pick it up. Squid Adler's level being a perfect example. Ready? No, not that, not that part. I meant the second half where you run on the ground like normal. Every room revolves around you having to hit these switches into their slots as it gradually gets more complex, like needing to time it carefully around two at once, but then having to do that but in a room with deadly spikes. That's a quality progression of difficulty, but it's one of those puzzles where you've already figured out the solution prior to starting to solve it, so you then have just to spend 20 seconds doing it. Is it bad? Not necessarily, but it's not really that fun either. This is how I feel about many levels of X5. Does the gravity flip gimmick of Dark Dizzy's stage suck? No, it's just not really that fun, and instead feels rather basic and bland. I gave a similar criticism to X3, but I obviously think X5 has it much worse because generally speaking, the pace of this game is very slow. Take Izzy Glow's stage, for example. Here you find yourself in this castle where these spikes drop from the ceiling really slowly, going up even slower than they came down, so you have to sit and wait several seconds for that whole animation to play out. The Skyver stage has three segments where you have to ride an elevator that takes a really long time. Even stages like Axel the Red or Mat Rex have a game-wide problem that brings the pace to a screeching halt that makes it very difficult to really get into the various stages. X and Zero have a full support team in X5. One of them being Alia, whose job it is to help X and Zero navigate the areas while they're out in the field. This is a fine concept, but in execution, it ruins the flow of the stages. How it works is that Alia will stop you dead in your tracks while the player must mash the buttons on the controller to skip past what she's saying. For my first run in this video, I decided to do something unthinkable. Actually read the various text boxes from Alia and other characters. It's here where you learn that she isn't saying anything besides worthless tutorial junk for the entire game. Like how she tells you during this part of Izzy Glow's stage that you should jump on the top side of the spike platforms to progress. Or how in Matt Rex's stage, she'll stop you twice in the span of 10 seconds to tell you that there's a diverging pathway. It's like her designed function is to take away any semblance of curiosity or experimentation from the players. These two issues, slow stages and alia text, collide at what might be my least favorite level in a Mega Man X game, Duff McWhalen. Here, players must go through an auto-scroller where they get chased by a giant underwater mechanoloid. Honestly, this could have been used to make for a fast-paced stage where you need to carefully outrun the robot, but it moves at the speed of molasses. So slowly that the obstacles are nothing to worry about because you have an eternity to react to them all. I might complain about frustrating Mega Man levels in various games, but when I'm just outright bored like I am in this stage, that's when the replayability really starts to dip. Alia might be bad and drag down the pace of okay levels, but on the whole, X5 is just a very slow-paced game in its main eight stages, which makes me not want to revisit the game over any of the previous X games. A slower pace is not the kind of problem where I can say the game's an abomination, but like I said, when you look at the things I enjoy about X games, with or without Alia, many of X5's stages are just not that fun to play. To rub salt in the wound, the game has unskippable cutscenes as well. I could talk about the cutscenes again when discussing X5's overall presentation, but that's another thing that gets in the way of me replaying this game. Not only do I have to mash through Alia babbling on in the stages, but then between stages I have to mash buttons to get through cutscenes I've already seen a million times. But hey, maybe the game makes up for it in the routing department. After all, this is the thing I enjoy most about X1 to X4. I focused on the item game in so many of my Mega Man X videos because the least backtracking experience is just so much fun for me. And it ties so heavily to the nostalgia I have for these games as I'd craft these perfect runs while I was in school way back in 8th grade. X5 dropping the ball here, as badly as it does, is the biggest thing I have against this game. To get into that, we must first discuss the collectibles the game has to offer. Basically, it's the same lineup from X4. 
We have 8 heart tanks that gradually increase your health, 2 sub tanks to refill your health, a weapon energy tank that does the same for weapon ammo, an EX tank which raises your default life count from 2 to 4, and we get something new. This game doesn't have 4 Dr. Light capsules to collect, it has 8. This isn't a repeat of the third armor situation in X3, it's two different armors in one game. In many ways, I just don't think they thought the collectibles in this game through. The game has an EX tank, like X4, but it's completely useless because of the fact that X5 changes the checkpoint system to be where game overs bring you back to the last checkpoint, including boss doors, so why would you need more lives when I basically have infinite lives already? See what I mean? It's like nobody questioned that item going in the game because it was in X4, not thinking of the effect it had on the mechanics of X5. Heart tanks also only work in the character you collect them as, which isn't terrible in theory, but potentially proves to be a major problem later that I can get into. But anyway, there are two armors for X to collect now, the Falcon Armor, which prioritizes mobility as you can use it to fly around the areas, and the Gaia Armor, which is really slow and clunky but is also immune to spikes. Personally, I think the Gaia armor should have been way more powerful to make up for its lack of speed since I really never use it unless I have to, and never felt that loss much at all. The armors themselves are fine though. The problem is X5's new system that nobody asked for. To use either the Falcon or Gaia armor, you must first unlock all four pieces of it. The biggest insult to injury being that the Gaia armor's head parts have no listed function. Dr. Light does not tell you what it does, and for that reason I can only conclude that it does nothing, and yet you're forced to collect it to use the other parts. Now, not being able to use the parts instantly makes enough sense. I mean, you can find these parts with no armor X, fourth armor X, zero, etc. But I must imagine there was some kind of memory limitation or what have you that caused it so that none of the parts are usable until they're all unlocked. The thing is, within the scope of this review, it doesn't really matter what the actual reason was, because the effect this has in the gameplay is way more important. I was setting up a few moments ago how important routing is to me as a Mega Man X fan, and that X5 dropped the ball pretty hard. With all the collectibles established, let's get into it. Routing in X5 can be done, but on a practical level, it's almost non-existent. When I replay X5, I almost always do it in the weakness order. Grizzly Slash, Duff McWhalen, Squid Adler, Izzy Glow, Dark Dizzy, The Skyver, Matt Rex, and Axel the Red. You can play X5 in a way that's different from this. For example, you can go to Matt Rex's stage first and get the Heart Tank as well as the Gaia Armor part located there. And as long as you have the F Laser, you'd be able to get every collectible from Dark Dizzy's stage. But this brings about the logistic matter I went over in the X1 re-review. The stage order is all about the strategic advantage. I used my going to Boomer Kawanga's stage before Spark Mandrills as the perfect example. It might prove more of a challenge to face the former boss without his weakness, but it saves you a backtrack to Spark Mandrills stage which requires Boomerang Cutter for its hidden sub-tank. You see, that kind of talk gets me really excited. But in X5, the strategic advantage of going outside the weakness order doesn't exist. I could go to Matt Rex's stage early and get his weapon and use that in Izzy Glow's level to get the EX tank, however, the heart tank requires me to have the Falcon or the Gaia armor, so what's the point? I'm just gonna have to revisit this stage for its heart tank anyway, so getting the EX tank early is pointless when they're right next to each other. Half the heart tanks in this game require the Gaia armor's immunity to spikes, but since you need the Falcon armor for the whole Gaia armor set, that means that once you've cleared all 8 stages and have finally gotten all the armors, to 100% the game, you must then do a grind where you have to revisit Grizzly Slash, Squid Adler, Izzy Glow, Axel the Red, and Duff McWhalen's stages to nab whatever it is you don't currently have. Duff McWhalen's stage is one where you have to play it three times in a 100% run because the part of the Falcon Armor is blocked by a wall you can only get past with the weapon received for beating this very stage. And then you come back again for the Heart Tank. 100%ing X5 leaves you with this massive backtrack dump at the end of the game and it's just tedious. You can use non-dev intended strats to get a hold of some armor parts early, and you can use the falcon armor to get the grizzly slash heart tank, when the reality is that you'll backtrack to these areas either way, it makes no difference how you actually do it, making this game possibly the most rigid of any Mega Man X game. So we have this game where I don't think its levels are super strong, I don't feel incentivized to pick different routes, and the item game is poorly laid out and requires a massive backtracking campaign to the end of the game. So the things I love about Mega Man X are poorly done in X5, which is why I don't come back to this game. In fact, this is my first full playthrough of X5 since the summer of 2020. It's just not that fun to replay when I could replay X1 to X4 at the drop of a hat. I could end the review here, because these are the systems that make me not enjoy X5, but the game has even more systems packed into the disc that are fundamentally flawed, and I'd like to go into these as well. But those issues first warrant a discussion on the game's story. Basically, Sigma's back yet again, and this time he's enlisted the help of a rogue named Dynamo. The two plot to bring a space colony called Eurasia crashing down onto the Earth. 
Sigma baits X and Zero into a battle which spreads the Sigma virus to Reploids all over the planet, turning countless Reploids into Mavericks. When the colony crashes, this will severely damage the planet and further spread the Sigma virus, which will bring out Zero's intended, villainous persona. X and Zero then only have a few hours to stop the colony crash and defeat Sigma once and for all. I like the plot of X5. On a first playthrough, I think fans of the series thus far will be entertained by the fact that they're never going to know what's going to happen and why. The cutscene where the lifesaver brings his worries about Zero to Cygnus, the leader of the Hunters, being a great example because this is where we hear for the first time that Zero is not just immune to the Sigma virus, but it makes him stronger, something you can actually see in the gameplay, as the virus damages X if taken in too many times, but heals and powers up Zero. I like the fact that they gave X and Zero a more permanent cast of supporting characters at the base in this game. It really helps make the Maverick Hunters feel like a team, especially after the supporting characters in X4 turned against you in both campaigns. X4 generally added more story to the game with each Maverick giving you dialogue before their boss fights, which is a step in the right direction, but X5 makes it more interesting since the Mavericks in this game aren't on a team like they were in X1 to X4. Here, each one is different. The point of each stage is to collect a part that the Maverick Hunters need to stop the colony, but the Maverick you fight is in possession of it. Each Maverick in the X series has their own backstory, but we get more of that in this game like Squid Adler being a former Maverick Hunter who was close with Launch Octopus, who X still feels bad about having killed, alongside all of his other former comrades turned Mavericks. The Skyver is another one where we're told that he was a former member of Repliforce who currently lacks a purpose in life. Each boss has their own backstory and different dialogue with X and Zero, as well as different dialogue depending on whether or not you need the part they have, and whether or not the colony has crashed. That's a lot of thought and effort put into the dialogue and characters, it's just a shame it doesn't get more fleshed out because this game, like many other X games, just throws these characters at you with no build-up or context. It works if you try to read the supplementary material and actually read the dialogue instead of just mashing through it. However, it just doesn't land for most players, not helped by the fact that the translation here is still not great. The usual offenses of typos and mistranslated names, wooden dialogue, all that stuff. Although, the translation isn't the biggest thing that interferes with my enjoyment of the cutscenes. That particular Razzie award goes to the presentation of the cutscene. X4 had these anime cutscenes during important moments, and while implying the acting has aged poorly would imply it was ever good at all, I still feel like having those cutscenes really shows how much budget went into Mega Man 8 and X4. In X5, you look at these stills for the whole scene, and there really aren't that many of them. Limited presentation isn't the end of the world, I just think visually these cutscenes are really static and dull to look at, and then the dialogue is bad too. For cutscenes you can't skip, I'm just left to wonder what the budget for this game even was. This game came out back in 2000, back when Capcom was all about spamming Mega Man as often as they could. Like I said, I feel like X4 was the game that had a good budget put into it, when by comparison X5 feels pretty cheap. The game came out three years after X4, but in between there were still a bunch of other Mega Man games released. Maybe the return on sales gradually lowered the budget. I don't know. I do know that even basic effects like the spiral staircase from X4 look remarkably worse in X5. Backgrounds sometimes look out of place, this background gets repeated for three stages in a row, the final boss is literally a PNG in the background, the animations for the new characters look nowhere near as smooth as X and Zero because their sprites are ripped from X4. The game just doesn't look right to me. So, I said I needed to talk about the story in order to further criticize the gameplay, and that was because of the additional parts system. When you beat a stage, Aelia will give you an option between weapons and life and weapons and energy. This gives you the choice between slightly expanding your health bar or your weapon energy meter. But after several stages, you'll notice that it says weapon and life plus, and weapon and energy plus. The reason is tied to the in-game time mechanic. X and Zero have 16 hours until the colony crashes. Playing a stage takes one hour away from your time. With each hour passed, the bosses all get harder to beat and when they reach a certain strength point after 5 or 6 game hours, beating them will give you extra parts to equip in the menu here. There really is a decent variety of extra equipment, such as eliminating knockback, reducing virus damage, increasing your jump height, your ground speed, your dash length, your X-Buster strength, your Z-Saber strength, and the list goes on. There's just one big issue with this, and it's that the game does not clearly communicate how this works to the player. This game is packed to the brim with overbearing, unskippable tutorials for the most obvious things you could think of, but when it comes to a more specific set of mechanics like this, you're just never told that the time in the game contributes to the amount of these parts you get. You also don't know which one you'll get from the two options until you've clicked on it. While normally I'm in favor of replay value, the issue is about creating clear mechanics for the player to work with. For players who want to max out the amount of parts they get, they just enter a stage, intentionally get a game over, return to the stage select, and repeat the process until every stage has a part unlocked. 
When this is the main strat, I just think the system was unnecessarily convoluted, which defines the player's path to the end game to a T. The Maverick Hunters first try blowing the colony up with the Enigma Cannon, and to power it up you need to collect pieces for it by visiting the four stages on the left side here. After that fails, the Hunters move on to piloting a rocket to blow the colony up, and to power that up you need to play the four stages on the right side here. Then that works and you progress to the final stages. While that sounds simple in theory, this is where things get very weird. The Enigma Cannon actually can work, and the shuttle can fail. Getting all the pieces for them increases your odds of success in both cases, but for both of them, success is tied to RNG. My favorite story to tell regarding this was my second playthrough of X5 from 2015. On my first run, I saw the Enigma fail and the shuttle succeed. I just assumed that was just what happened in the story, but by my second playthrough, I did all the same things, but the shuttle failed and I saw Zero turn evil and challenge X. I was pretty spooked. It was like I had some creepy pasta game or something. So I shut it off and came back to it the next day, loaded my save file from right before the cutscene, and the shuttle miraculously worked this time. I genuinely had no idea what I did that could have possibly triggered that bad ending scenario, but I do now. It's random whether or not the cannon or shuttle work. Another decision from the devs which is just bizarre. In practice, it does create a pretty large balance issue though. So let's say you picked Zero at the start of X5. That means X does not have the fourth armor during the game, but you like playing as Zero more than X, so it doesn't matter. I mean, Zero is a powerhouse against bosses in this game, so why not play as him more? Well, if the shuttle fails and Zero turns into his awakened self, then you can no longer play as him. You're stuck as X without any armor. Let's say you gave Zero all the buffs you could throughout the game. To stand a remote chance as X during the final stages, you need to then backtrack to over half the stages in the game to collect the Falcon armor and Gaia armor parts to grab the remaining heart tanks, and then you can try for the final levels. You could try playing it as X with no armor in the final levels, but your failure is basically inevitable. Or at least it's a steep challenge. You could make the case that this means it's a good thing that several heart tanks are exclusive for X, because that way, if this happens, you can still increase your health bar but I think the players would just not be put in this really bad position if the game just powered up both characters as you played it, or just offered a more streamlined way to power up characters, like Mega Man X8 instead of going on a massive scavenger hunt. These are the fundamental flaws of Mega Man X5, systems that just do not feel fleshed out or thoughtfully considered or are just outright broken in that you can just load a save file as many times as you want to get a different shuttle outcome. It's just hard to picture where the devs were coming from with so many of these design choices, and that's the only way I can really look at X5 nowadays. However, that doesn't have to be where the story ends. For years, I've talked about how amazing Mega Man X3 The Zero Project is. I always knew that there existed full-on improvement projects for X5 and X6 from Ace Diaz on romhacking.net, the guy who also did the undub mod for X4 I talked about in that re-review. I think I've dabbled in both the X5 and X6 projects before, but never gave them a deeper look. So now is the time. Let me tell you, with X5, I was very impressed with what I played. You can find the full list of changes on the forum post with the download link, but to highlight the ones that really impacted my play experience, first, Alia can now be disabled from the menu, so you will not be interrupted while trying to play the stages. The level design is still not the best thing in the world, but all the other major issues I have with X5 have been improved. The translation's been fixed like he did for X4, so the story is more enjoyable. Cutscenes can now all be skipped, including in-game cutscenes with the Mavericks. Duff McWhalen's stage has been made much faster so that you won't be bored out of your skull playing it. The Maverick names have all been changed to their original names. I haven't mentioned that thus far, but each Maverick in America was based on Guns N' Roses, with many fans just preferring them to have the names they were meant to. Crescent Grizzly, Tidal Whale, Volt Kraken, Shining Firefly, Dark Necrobat, Spiral Pegasus, Burn Dino Rex, and Spike Rose Red. I think these are better and more consistent Maverick names, but I just kept using the translated names when writing this script because I'm more used to it. In terms of gameplay tweaks, I already mentioned the lack of Alia, but things got really interesting when you first find out that all the heart tanks work with both characters, so that problem is fixed. Collecting all four pieces of the shuttle guarantees success, while launching it with no parts guarantees failure, creating clear and effective parameters to achieve the good and bad endings, which is such a great improvement. You no longer need to burn several game hours to unlock parts. Instead, finished stages will grant you both the parts that the stage would have unlocked but it's not broken because you can only equip so many at a time. Having access to all the parts in X5 was so interesting for me because it allowed me to experiment with them in a way I never have before, and getting a speed increase while increasing the range of, say, the Z Saber really made the game a lot more fun. It allowed the stages to feel more fast-paced, even if the designs aren't as good as the best of X2 or X4. 
The mother of all improvements being the item game. I got so excited reading that the item game got enhanced and this got me curious on what the possibilities were now. To give some highlights, using the lightning ability, X can get the heart tank and light capsule from Tidal Whale Stage, completely removing those two awful backtracks. You can also get the light capsule with a charged spike ball. Zero's twin dream move can get the head parts of the Gaia armor. Zero can push these blocks out of the way that were once Gaia armor exclusive. And on the subject of armors, collecting the pieces gives you limited functionality that is boosted when you collect all of them, a perfect remedy for the problem introduced in the original game. This really got my mind racing to think of the possibilities. I collected every item within 90 minutes in the improved project, when in the original I'd still be grinding by the 2 hour mark. That's how much of an effect these changes have on the gameplay. I'll keep playtesting this after the video is out and craft a full, least backtracking run of X5 now that one can be made thanks to this project. I couldn't be happier to say as well. This is a bit of a mid-edit update, but I kept experimenting with the possibilities here, and yes, a run of X5 with only one backtrack is entirely possible with the project, and like I said, I'm really happy to say that. Just get used to bizarre exploits and abusing iframes. I'm putting the stage order on the screen right now. That's just a list of changes that were important to me, but there are even more to look into if you're curious. The link is below. I loved the X5 improvement project, and now I'm looking forward to giving X6 a go for the next video. With all that said, you know the rules. It's time to discuss the end game of Mega Man X5. The game was supposed to be the climax of the Mega Man X series, and with the final stages, they went all out with the references. Like Mega Man 2 Quick Man lasers in the first of the final stages, the Yellow Devil from Mega Man 1, and other Mega Man games, being brought back for the boss of this level. Even turning into the final boss of Mega Man 6 for a brief moment. This fight is really drawn out because the thing barely takes any damage, but with the crouch move, you don't have to worry about dodging as much as you did in the original Mega Man. Or you could injure your thumb with the non-dev intended strats. Virus Stage 2 is reminiscent of the first castle stage from Mega Man X1, coming with a more complex rematch against the boss of Sigma Palace 2 from that game. More complex than it has four weaknesses for each component instead of just one. Virus Stage 3 being where you can unlock the ultimate armor as No Armor X, and the black armor for Zero, two must-haves for the final level. The ultimate armor was in X4, but only as a cheat code, so I didn't bother mentioning it. The black armor was also a cheat code in X4, but it was a cosmetic rather than a stats boost. Here you can use the unlimited Nova Strike without feeling like a cheater because it's in the game. I especially use this in the boss against Zero with no shame. Oh yeah, that's also a thing that happens. The X series has been setting up an XV Zero battle since the end of X2, and the result is super lame. Well, in the good ending scenario. Obviously, when Zero is awakened to his true purpose that Dr. Wily created him for, that's good drama for an X vs. Zero battle. But in the good ending scenario, the lifesavers in X are concerned that Zero is not affected by the virus and want him to go back to base. And he doesn't want to, so they fight and it ends in a draw. X is like, I do trust you, Zero. That's why I'm gonna beat the crap out of you. That's motivation that sounds like it belongs in a Sonic Rivals game. The main reason why I prioritize grabbing the ultimate armor in X5 is because the last level is quite atrocious. Say it with me, a boss rush in the same stage as the final boss. But this time, with the unique twist that the boss's health bars are ginormous, meaning that you'll be here for an eternity. To be more precise, eight minutes with the ultimate armor just flying back and forth. By this point, you either agree with me or you don't about these boss rushes just being tedious garbage padding. Can't really add any more to it than I haven't said in the last six calendar years. If you beat the final boss in a world where Zero was awakened, then you get the bad ending where the AI of Dr. Light saves X and wipes Zero from his memory banks to avoid the pain of remembering his best friend turning evil. But if you beat the final boss where Zero didn't turn evil, then you get the good ending where Zero still dies, but X carries on using his Z-Saber as a way to remember him. Beating the game as Zero just sees his final reflection as he's dying. His fight with Sigma when he got discovered, the death of Iris, and finally understanding his visions with Dr. Wily. Something the game set up in an interesting cutscene earlier, when Zero asked Dr. Light at the Grizzly Slash Capsule if he knows who this mysterious scientist he's plagued by is. To which Dr. Light says he might if he got to see him, but otherwise does not. Again, lots of stuff going on at the end here, some of which I'm saving for the X6 story discussion, so for right now I'll just leave it at that and give my overall final thoughts on X5. Like I discussed way earlier in the video, X5 is a game I've not played all the way through since the summer of 2020. Going into this video, I was thinking it could go in any direction. Maybe I'd be more negative than ever? Maybe more positive? I'm open for just about anything when it comes to replaying video games. But yeah, not much has changed here when it comes to the base X5. I just don't think it's that fun. I sum it up as thus. X5 is an okay game. You can totally survive a playthrough without begging for the game to end. But it's also not a game I'd really want to come back to. At least it's not for me. Ignoring the fact that I've played the game like a hundred times, but you know what I mean. 
X1 through X4 are just games I can replay any day, like I've said, and X5 just drops the ball on everything I enjoy about those games. However, the Improvement Project has definitely changed the conversation. Because of that project, I'm now actively looking forward to playing more of X5 in the coming days and weeks, trying to see how I can further perfect the run. I don't think I've uttered the thought of how much fun it would be to replay Mega Man X5 again since like 2015 or 16. But does it save the game? The raw level design still makes me think the game isn't perfect as I'd rather play any of the previous games over the improved X5, but you know what? I don't think it really matters. The improved X5 is so great because it takes out every silly, convoluted mechanic that nobody asked for in the original and creates a significantly streamlined version of X5 that is loads more fun than the original. Sure, it doesn't change the levels entirely to make it the best game of all time or anything, but you know, an improvement doesn't have to be the greatest game ever for me to say that they did a great job fixing it up. There can be ground in between literal perfection and what we got in 2000. So I'm going to keep replaying the X5 improvement project, and appreciating the work that was put in to make it really unique and stand out. Now then, the X5 video is done. A lot of the same points and issues as the original, but obviously in a more acceptable tone and higher quality presentation compared to 2017. Maybe the re-review is redundant, I don't know. I do know this though. I wouldn't be caught dead watching the old one, and I'm happy with what I have written here, so yeah. Naturally though, this begs the question of what's going to happen in regards to the next video. The new video on Mega Man X6. Well, I think I'll just leave it there. Hope I see everyone for the new video on X6 coming next week. In the meantime, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.